Thank you. That was very, very kind. Uh, I'm so proud to be back on the Cumberland Plateau. Uh, it's enlarging to be here. I, um, I'm going to read a short story, relatively new, and uh, I, it occurs to me, people often ask where the stories come from, where do you get the idea for that story, and when they ask me that question, I tend to ignore it or pretend I didn't hear them and change the subject, but I thought for once, since I know specifically where this story came from, I might start out telling you a little bit about it. I hope it doesn't ruin the story. But there are two main elements. The first is the Oxford English Dictionary. They have this thing I used to subscribe to. You can all do it for free. You get a word a day, a word a day from the OED. And sometimes they're very fun and confounding. But I'll never forget this day, it was a Saturday, I got the word Mami Wata, which I'd never heard before. And it says, uh, water spirit it takes the form of a man or a woman, a woman or a man. And so I thought, this is an interesting idea. I need to research this. So I put it in the pot, put some seasoning on it, and let it marinate. And then there's a show I love on Animal Planet. <laughs> it's called River Monsters. <laughs> Have you ever seen River Monsters? There's, there's some people who like River Adam Vines. I know you like this. Um, there's the guy, there's this Brit, his name is Jeremy Wade, and he's the real deal. I, I like him so much. First of all, because he's so humble, um, and second, because if you watch the um, advertisements for the show, you think it's another lurid, you know, it's about man-eating fish, and, you know, people disappearing in dark, dank rivers, and, um, and you think it's going to be one of those Sasquatch-type shows. But he always catches a fish. And there's some big suckers too. And um so I, I like it because he you know he's very he knows his biology. Um he's he's very respectful because he's going to places like Africa, South America, India. Um he's very respectful of the indigenous peoples. He's he's almost it's almost as if he's trying to deconstruct the idea of the great white hunter. And so he takes time to learn the cultures of the people he's around. And I'll never forget, there's this one episode where he's at a great freshwater lake um, in Central Africa. And they're looking for this, I think it was a catfish. Uh, you know, they're battling crocodiles, and he's with some of the people from, the, from the, the local tribe trying to find this deadly fish. And they catch it. And see, that's what I like about it. He always catches stuff. And he catches this monster fish. And they're all happy, and they're going, they're going back to the, uh, to the village with it to show it off. And he's like, well, you know, in the Western tradition, we do catch and release. So we're going to release this fish. And they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, that's what I always do. I, I catch the fish, but I let them back out. And they're like, mm. <laughs> We fought a crocodile for this fish. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So he gets the fish back to the village, and he sees how everybody is celebrating, and you know their mouths are watering. They're going to eat this fish, and he he does this this self check, and he thinks about you know I'm getting paid by the BBC, and I can afford to catch fish and release them, and this is a really important thing to these people. So he joins in celebration. So I thought that was really wonderful. So they can't they've canceled River Monsters, and. <laughs> But it's playing all the time. You can catch it if you want to. Um, they cancel River Monsters. And you know what they do? They do a marathon. And my students tell me, don't never brag about binge watching TV. But I watched it. It was on a Sunday afternoon, so I, couldn't, I didn't feel too guilty. And he's at, a, 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 I think it's the Zambezi River. And he, suddenly, this, this is a, the, the West African culture, he's talking to the people who live there. And they start talking about the water spirit. Mami Wata. And it was like the universe nudges me in the side and says, I thought you were going to write that story, boy. <laughs> and so I did. Now, after all that, you're going to see why I never tell you where the stories come from. <laughs> okay, this story is called Mami Wata. And at the heading is a quote from Langston Hughes. I've known rivers, ancient dusty rivers. She took her time, walking like a fawn. Oh, and I should say thank you, Jill, for who's bringing this story out in plowshares. Thank you. 
She took her time, walking like a fawn, careful not to make a twig snap. It was getting dark, but she could still see plenty. The voice grew and rose, and the color as cool as mint. Like what Aunt Inez grew in a pot. Cool spearmint, she called it. She caught a glimpse of him, standing out in the middle of the creek, and he was quite a sight. Darker than she, with a wild head of hair, big berry lips, and his eyes seemed to flash in the dimming light. He was not exactly singing, more like humming, but in tune and to a rhythm foreign to her ears yet familiar. The water came up to his belly button, and he seemed to be doing nothing but standing there in the water, humming and bathing his dark skin glistening with water, and he spooned handfuls upon himself, humming his ditty. What you doing out yonder? She called to him. The man turned toward her with his flashing eyes and grinned in a playful fashion. Who are you, she said. What you doing out there? And who are you, little girl? His voice was deep, deeper than old man Pharaoh's. I ain't no little girl. The man waded closer to the shore, but stopped and said, How old are you? They tell me I'll be ten and four come next moon. She stood on the shore. He stood in the water for a quantity of minutes, eyeing each other. She with curiosity, him with placidity. What you doing out yonder then? Just standing. What you watching for? You possess a great many questions for a 14-year-old girl. Ain't Inez said I got gumption? I suppose you do. Do you like catfish? Who don't? Another question. Come back tomorrow and I'll have one waiting for you. Where you live at? Wherever I take a notion. She grunted. It was getting dark and she did not want to be down there at the creek's edge in the dark. You better come out of here. You better come out of there, son. Why? It ain't safe. You think you're safe where you are? Safer than standing in that black creek. Ain't you afraid of gators and moccasins? Not really. Come back tomorrow. With that, she backed up slowly until her back came against a tree. She turned and dashed up the trail. When she got back to the camp, Aunt Inez was standing by the kitchen. Where you been, gal? I seen a rabbit. I went a hunting it. You ain't you aim to catch a rabbit, barehanded gal. You ain't never caught no rabbit. Why are you rabbit crazy today? Seem like a smart thing to do, girl. I have told you time and time again not to stray stray too far from camp, alone without men folk with you. You never know how far them dogs and catchers will come out here. You and Uncle Pharaoh say they ain't gonna come this far into the swamp. Ain't no telling. We always got to be ready to run. Aunt Inez looked her up and down, taking her in. Amanda could not tell if she was approving or disapproving. The older woman sucked air through her teeth. Go fetch me a pail of rainwater from that barrel over there and bring me some more wood and be quick about it. It did at this point occur to her to tell Aunt Inez about the humming bathing man out in the creek. But when she opened her mouth to speak, no words fell out. This word her, worried her the way a mosquito bite worries. She went to fetch the water and the wood. She could smell the fish stew on the fire. That night, her dreams were populated by dark men with broad shoulders emerging from the creek. They were not nightmares, but she felt, but they left her feeling uneasy and querulous inside and to feel curious things in curious places. The next day, after a breakfast of leftover fish stew and cornbread, the crawdads were even sweeter the next day, she spent the morning splitting wood and weeding the cornrows. Aunt Inez sent her down to the creek to do some pot washing with a cake of lye scope, soap and a rag. She fully expected to see the man, but no man was there. All during her washing and scrubbing, she kept looking up and all about, but no man. Mandy felt the same way she felt when Pharaoh didn't come back to camp after a visit to the plantation. 
She lingered on the banks, but gave up by and by, thinking hard thoughts of the well-made bather as she hauled the pots back to camp. Rastus had caught a rabbit that morning, and Aunt Inez helped Manny skin it. She allowed us how this was probably the rabbit she had seen the night before. A lie. Aunt Inez only moaned a moan, neither in the affirmative nor in the negative, communicating that it did not matter one way or the other. Twas just the way things were. She now had another rabbit hide to tan and add to the quilt. Mandy loved to spend time rubbing her hand up and down the large tapestry of rabbit fur, black, brown, snow white, and mottled, so strong over you against the cold. It was a time she would feel bad for the murdered rabbits, but nowadays she got lost in the soft luxury of the thing. Plus, rabbits were good eating. She could not deny it. But the quilt reminded her of pretty things the mistress owned back at Charybdis Plantation, expensive and lovely to touch. She reckoned she liked it better here. No, she did not, she did not reckon. She knew. The sun commenced to go down, the shadows stretched out, and Mandy looked about for Aunt Inez, who was in the kitchen house. The smoke light as, if, as it tended to waft, and she snuck down the trail to the water. A fat black snake crawled across the path a distance in front of her, and Mandy suddenly wished she had shoes, though she liked going barefoot when it was warm like this. She heard the humming before she could see the water. She stopped, stock still. This time, she decided to hide herself and fell to her knees and crawled into the thick cattails to the east of where the man bathed and hummed to himself. He stopped humming. Amanda, why do you hide, child? Mandy stood up. I ain't no child. Why are you hiding? Arms akimbo, she asked. Who, who is you, fool? The laughter was made of many things, and Mandy did not know what to think of it. Was he funning her, or was he just having fun? Was he happy out there, all wet and fixing to get it? Was he laughing because he called, she called him a fool and he wasn't? There was a, it was a deep rolling laugh, the color of molasses, and his body shook. Ripples swam out from him in round, wavy circles. He stared straight at her, bobbing up and down, lightly, lightly like a stick. I am one of you. Now he was still and staring at her. I promised you a fish, didn't I? It rose up behind him without a sound. No water, slurps or splashes, slowly. So beautiful it was, see-through and bright. Two round things, a point sticking up at each top. It was bigger than his head, wider than his shoulders, and covered the all of him like a great big oak bough full of leaves. The thing shone in the fainting light the last rays of the sun dancing on it like pixies or fairies. It looked like it was waving at Mandy, gently as if in a breeze, but there was no breeze. A holler came up in Mandy's throat, but no sound leached out, only a puny grunt. And with that grunting, the thing flipped down into the water, made a scary loud slap against the flatness and went under. The water behind the man seemed to boil and rumble. Directly it came back up with force and direction over his head. And right in front of her, with a loud wet thud, there wriggled the largest catfish Mandy had ever seen in her life. She ran. She ran hard. And stopped behind a catalpa tree, tall and skinny, but wide enough to hide her small frame. She was breathing rough, and her heart was beating harder than ever, than even the night of the fire and the raid where she was taken away from the quarters. The dark night full of flashes, full of smoke, and full of screams. Mandy peeked out to see. The man was still standing there, grinning. The dog-sized catfish was still wriggling on the ground, its whiskers each looking longer than her legs, the mouth big enough to swallow her whole. She struggled with it, carrying it in her arms, trying to avoid the whiskers, which looked mighty sharp. But it, but it kept slipping from her grasp, and she kept having to stop to catch her breath. 
By the time she made it back to the catalpa tree, she'd stopped and looked back, but the fellow in the water was gone. Mandy felt angry with him, but was glad to be hauling back a big fish. And Inez was the first to see her clambering up the trail with a beast slipping around in her arms. woo called Inez. Rastus came running and, much to Mandy's delight, lifted the slimy burden from her. Uncle Pharaoh was standing there at the top of the trail. She knew what this return meant. He would commence to learn her the proper way to cipher and call letters, as he did every time he returned to camp. Mandy was not exactly sure she enjoyed this reading and writing business, but she knew it was important to learn. You catch that fish, gal? Uncle Pharaoh didn't look like he was either impressed or worried, just calm. Yes, sir, I did. Now, why the Sam hell you want to lie to me, child? I'll tell you the plain truth, Uncle. That, that there catfish jumped straight out of the water, right high, just as pretty as you please, and landed on the dry ground, right at my feet. I ain't even seen nothing to beat it. Pharaoh grunted the way annoyed bulls sometimes grunt. By now, Rastus and Inez had nailed the catfish down to a board, hacked off its head, and commenced to peel back the thick hide, which Rastus had to put great effort into doing. I heard you talking to somebody out there at the creek earlier. Who was it? Pharaoh asked. Just this fella out there swimming? And you were going to keep this secret from the rest of us, were you? Was that your plan, Amanda? No, sir. I assume he's a Negro like us. Yes, sir. He give you that catfish? Yes, sir. It's a big one. Pharaoh joined Rastus and Inez, who were gutting the fish. Looks like we got a friend. What you talking about, Pharaoh? Down by the creek. I prayed to her, and she sent a friend. Now, there you go again, talking all that African foolishness, Inez said. Ain't nobody believing in them overseas magic people but you, old man. How you reckon that skinny little girl caught a catfish that big? Inez sucked her teeth dismissively. Mandy, go fetch me some water, gal. Upon her return, Pharaoh put his hand on Amanda's head. You need to be on the lookout all the time, gal, especially when you wander away from camp. I ain't going to try to clip your wings or nothing, but I need you to tell me you will be careful. You hear? Yes, sir. The next day, Mandy had been itching to go down by the creek since she woke up and figured she'd wait till the dimming of the day, just like the other times. This time, she approached the water. As she approached the water, she saw the man rise to the surface, head first. Hey, Amanda. Hey, yourself. Was that old cat, old fish good? Sure enough. Mandy found it difficult to look him directly in the eye today. What was that yesterday? That thing you brought up out of the water? That was me. What you talking about? That was you. What does that mean? Of a sudden, the man cocked his head to, to the side at a peculiar angle. Shh, he said, listening to Mandy. Listening to Mandy did not know what. What's the... I said, be still, child. What? Sternly, be still. By and by, she heard in the distance the baying of the dogs, hounds, no doubt, and a great crashing, not too terribly far away, it sounded like. You need to come with me right now. I need to do what? Don't be afraid, child. I will protect you. The man spread his big arms wide open, and Mandy felt herself impressed by how wide they were. Pharaoh always said they were bound to be found out, to always be ready to pick up and run deeper into the swamp. The dogs were getting closer, and she could hear the voices of the catchers hollering. She figured she wouldn't, couldn't run back to camp in time. Besides, come to me, child, get in the water. Mandy could hear the dogs louder, closer, crashing through the brush, she peered into the woods to see what she could see. Mandy, you must come now. Time is wasting. Mandy was not thinking as she dipped her bare feet into the water and stepped in. Not too cool, not too cool at all. Warm like rabbit fur. Warm like a belly full of hot chicken. 
warm like a freshly picked ear of corn, warm like a ripe tomato, warm like Aunt Inez's hands. Thank you.